Well, hello, hello, hello. I am Pastor Rhonda, founder of Celebrate Life Cancer Ministry and your host for Celebrate Life today. I am so excited. I have Dr. Carrie Williams with me. Hi, Carrie. Hello, Pastor Rhonda. <laughs> and she is going to talk about how to care for your hair, both for men and for women. And we have some exciting information to get started to share with you today. But before we get started, let me just share just a little bit about Celebrate Life Cancer Ministry. We are a all cancer type support organization and we help individuals with uh, outreach, which means uh, those that need to have a screening and are having challenges, we can help them get screening um, through helping them through their cancer journey uh, to help to keep them on the curriculum, the, the curriculum of care, on the circle of care. And um, we do home and hospital visitation, telephone buddies, treatment buddies, and even if necessary, hospice support. So we are a uh, all around cancer organization for all cancer types. If you are a cancer survivor or a caregiver that just has questions and needs support, please feel free to reach out to us uh, on our website, which is celebratelifecm.org. But enough of who we are right now, let's uh, get started with this hair conversation because African-Americans always have questions about the hair. <laughs> so Dr. Carey, please uh, share with us. Yes, well, thank you so much for having me on the show today, Pastor Rhonda. And like you said, when it comes to talking about hair, we can talk about hair all day. So I'm super excited. Um, for your viewers, I am a licensed barber, a licensed cosmetologist, and I am a trichologist, which is a specialist in hair and scalp disorders. I have my doctorate. So I work very closely with medical dermatologists to help find solutions around hair loss and scalp discomfort for both men, women, and children. Um, I've been a salon owner for over 14 years and I have a very strong platform around education, around providing styling services to help keep the hair healthy. A lot of my services, we specialize in natural hair styling. So we don't use extreme forms of heat or chemicals to change the state of the hair, but we find ways to style the hair to keep it in its healthiest state. Um, so I'm, I'm super excited to answer any questions that come in and also too, to have this discussion with you, Pastor Rhonda, around hair, because I can talk about it all. Oh, you're muted. One thing that we want to definitely talk about before we get too far off is um, hair and cancer survivors. But I think we probably, you know, I want to just jump in there and that surely cannot be the beginning. So um, one of the things I enjoyed seeing on your website was that you were science based. Yes. Um, I do a lot of research and to have evidence based, science based um, information is truly the best way to go. So wherever you think we need to start in this conversation, let's start in something that makes sense to us. Yes. Um, well, I mean, ah, the conversation around hair is so broad. I would say a lot of the questions that I get around hair care and it being science based, especially because the majority, my market are, are black women. So I serve predominantly uh, people who look like me, black people. And a lot of the questions that come in are around the care of our hair, the products that we should use. And especially after coming out of COVID, we have more and more people. We already had a lot of people who were um, transitioning back to natural hair. We've seen over the years um, more and more natural hairstyles um, that are being seen on larger media platforms and things like that, more examples of it. And there are more questions coming up on how to care for our hair. And so um, I would say, I would just generally start when it comes to the care of our hair that we just need to keep it simple. We just need to keep it simple. So when I talk about simplicity, I like to always tease and say, when I consult with a lot of people within my clinical setting, um, I'm always seeing pictures 
or I'm hearing stories about when they were younger, hair is flourishing, it's long, it's thick, it's healthy. And when we start getting into the hair care routine, you know, what were we doing? And I mean, I'm I'm one of these women, you know, we were shampooing our hair, we were putting grease and oil on our hair. <laughs> We were tying it down and we were, you know, going about our way. And I feel that what has happened, you know, things evolve. The the industry has evolved, um, but we've become bombarded with so much information. And I think a lot of the simplicity and how to care for our hair has been lost with so much information around products, around um, regimens, around what's right, what's wrong. And so I like to start off this conversation about how, I use the word simple, and sometimes people are just like, Dr. Care is really simple, but it really is about simplifying our routines and getting back to the basics. Okay, someone says, um, say when you when you look good, you feel good, and especially when you start with your crown. <laughs> yes, yes. And, and someone else may mention that their cancer survivor had alopecia before losing their hair, and mm -hmm. what should they do to help their hair grow? So there are different types of alopecia. Um, in general, the word alopecia um, means hair loss. So if there was, and there's two types of alopecia, there's a scarring form of alopecia, meaning that the follicles, which is where, which supports the hair strands, if they're scarred, then that means they can no longer produce hair. And then there's non-scarring forms of alopecia where there's hair loss that's experienced, but it's only temporary and the hair will grow back. And so for Jill, who's asking um, the question, depending on the type of alopecia that existed um, prior to going and experiencing chemotherapy will determine you know, the hair growth. If you were diagnosed with a non-scarring form of alopecia, and this oftentimes shows up as alopecia areata, where you have like small circles um, or patches of hair that fall out but grow back over time, um, then similarly, once the immune system gets back in balance, then the hair should go back to its normal growth cycle. If you experience the form of scarring alopecia, which oftentimes for black women shows up in the form of traction, whether it's around the hairline due to styling practices, or sometimes in the center of the head due to styling practices, um, after you go through chemotherapy treatment, those follicles have still been scarred. So you're not going to experience much regrowth. So to understand how to help your hair grow, first need to know what type of alopecia you experience, if it's scarring or non-scarring. If you are experiencing a non-scarring form of alopecia, again, you want to make sure this is diagnosed by your doctor. There are oftentimes topical corticosteroids that can be prescribed to help eliminate local inflammation in the scalp that could be preventing the hair from growing. Um, I like to talk to my clients oftentimes about Rogaine, um, which is a product on the market that everyone is familiar with, the active ingredient being minoxidil. And minoxidil is just one of those ingredients that's been approved by the FDA to show that it does increase um, hair growth in active follicles. So remember, they're not scarred, um, but it doesn't mean that the use of Rogaine will completely eliminate hair loss. Um, but those are some options that do exist um, for hair growth as a result of alopecia. So hopefully, Jill, that gives you some insight into what you can do um, based on the type of hair loss you experience um, prior to the chemotherapy. Um, how likely you will be able to grow your hair back in those areas. We can't hear your beautiful voice, Ms. Ryan. I'm sorry, I have, I have noise in my background, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but when, um, when you talk about men and hair loss, is theirs very similar to ours? Because I know that all men who have chosen to be bald maybe did not choose by choice. Right. So, um, is, so is theirs different from ours or is it pretty much the same? Well, when it comes to men losing um, hair, 
it's typically due to hormonal reasons. And it's a form of hair loss called androgenic alopecia. And that's a form of alopecia that does show up both in men and in women, but just in different times of life. So the androgen or the male hormone is at the root cause of this form of alopecia. So for men, typically what they will experience if they have some um, factors, um, hormonal factors, hereditary factors um, that already exist that make them susceptible to this form of hair loss, they're gonna experience it early on in life, late 20s, early 30s, when the androgen or that male hormone is spiking. So they might start to experience a little bit of diffuse or thinning. So you might have some young men, like you said, who have now chosen to go bald. They probably started to see a little bit of thinning in their crown when they were younger. And they probably have some indication if someone in their family, a father, a grandfather, and even on the mother's side, started to experience this form of hair loss. Um, for women, what typically happens is this form of hair loss will show up in menopausal age. So again, the source of this type of hair loss is the androgen hormone. So for women, if they have hereditary factors or hormonal factors that make them susceptible to this type of hair loss, once they go through menopause, when the estrogen levels decrease, so there's not enough estrogen to suppress the effects of the androgen hormone, you will see women typically in menopausal age start to experience a similar form of thinning and hair loss in the crown around the temples. Um, so that is the cause. And what I oftentimes recommend for both men and women is the moment you start to experience any type of hair loss, um, where you notice thinning, um, or you just notice like there's a shift in the density of your hair, to so talk to a professional right away. Because it's typically as soon as we can identify the, the cause of the hair loss, even if it's hereditary and hormonal, the sooner you can begin to incorporate things into your regimen to prevent total hair loss. But at least men, they have like an easier time when they go through it to cut all their hair off. And there's some women who make the choice, but it's a lot harder just because of, you know, hair and what it represents around identity for women to make the choice just to go bald. Yeah. Wow. So, but what about um, just breaking? Your hair is just breaking. Just it, no matter what you try to do, because I tell you, I had a cabinet full of hair care products. They said, it's good for this, it's good for that. And I wish there was a system where we could swap hair products. Okay, I've used these 20 and you've used these five. So let's just swap and you can try these and see if they work and then I'll try this. <laughs> well, you know, I think when it comes to breakage, one of the things that we don't do or we don't even understand is that the health, the strength of our hair starts from the inside out. It starts really systemically. What we see is dead tissue. And so the hair strands that we see, the growth starts on the inside. And all of the cells that become hardened and form this hair strand that we see on the outside is nourished first in the body from just like how we, all the nutrients, all the nutrients and vitamins that, that we get through food or supplementation, our hair cells need that too. So if you're experiencing, you know, extreme forms of breakage, yes, there are products on the market, we're marketed to all the time, that can help to strengthen this hair strand, this tissue, that can help soften it and do different things. But if you're experiencing excessive breakage, then the question then becomes for me as a trichologist, what is the lifestyle? What's happening systemically? that could be interfering with the hair growth cycle or causing the hair strand to become more fragile where it's breaking easily. And then there may be some styling practices that are contributing to the fragility of the hair strand. So are you doing a lot of chemical processing on the hair, a lot of heat styling on the hair? And with the products that you're using, are they balanced where you're getting enough moisture to maintain the elasticity of your hair strand and enough protein to keep it strong. So there are a number of factors, um, but I know like as women, there's so many products, we get excited and, and like they're marketing. They're like, 
you know, well, this is going to stop your breakage. And we like load up on it. And then you might find that you're still experiencing the problem. So for anyone, uh, including yourself, Pastor, who is experiencing breakage, it's always just important to get to the root because we'll find ourselves investing and buying so many products and we still don't have the solution. But we got to slow down, partner with professionals that you trust, hair care professionals who you have a relationship with and or can point you in the direction of someone who can help you so that when you are investing in products and or additional support, then you can make sure you're investing in the right things and not just having a bunch of things. <laughs> And sure, sure, uh, surely we could save some money. And that money that we invested in all these, <coughs> excuse me, different products, we could have invested in the professional to get the work done right. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought about that. I said, gee, when I, when I gave away the box, because I did give it away, um, when I gave it away, I said, wow, that's a hairstylist fee right there. You know, we often talk about what we cannot afford. Mm -hmm. And if we would simply invest the money in the right things, we would have the outcome that we need and, and only be paying for the things that we actually need. Mm -hmm. And then we can afford the things that seem to be high priced. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I preach it. <laughs> I mean, same thing with food. And so when we think about food, so are there certain foods that we should be eating that would make a difference in our hair? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, as a trichologist, I promote holistic health. So definitely, definitely everything we put in our bodies affects our body. Hair is an accessory organ, meaning our body doesn't need it. So it's so important for us to have just an overall healthy lifestyle and our hair is gonna be a reflection of our overall health. When I teach my students, I tell them hair is the barometer of health. So if you're getting enough nutrients and vitamins to keep your body going, then all that's left over is gonna to go to the accessory organs, your hair, your nails, those things are gonna flourish. But the thing about the hair, the nails, the skin, is that they are some of the fastest replicating cells in the body. So they're going to pick up on changes in the systemic environment a lot faster than some of your larger organs. So again, if you have a balanced lifestyle and you're taking in more alkaline foods, I mean, I feel like we all know you need to eat your fruits, you need to eat your vegetables. And of course, everything's different. So if you have allergies and things like that, you want to check in. But when it comes to the type of diet, it should be full of raw, fresh, healthy food. And being very mindful of processed foods, being very mindful of refined sugar, um, being very mindful of saturated fats. Because the same way that we see how it affects the body as far as high blood pressure, hypertension, um, and then other issues with um, organs within our body, diabetes, all of those things, all of that impacts the hair growth cycle because everything's mm -hmm. interconnected. So when I have questions around health, take care of your body. Your hair will flourish. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, okay. So you said fruit and vegetables. And I, I just always say this. I just wish that we could see inside our body so that we could see what we just ate just did to us yes or, or have a barometer on our finger that that turns red when we ate bad stuff or green when we just did something really good it's like you know because i wear my my fitbit it's like oh man i did this and i did this right i got my little badge i you know we need our own individual um reward system so that when we're doing the right thing and yellow when we're not doing anything effective you know <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Some type you of know, something, you know. So all those entrepreneurs out there, inventors, create something like that, you know, that fits in the watch or whatever. That is like ding, 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 ding. You know, you should not have eaten that, and you know it. Put it down. Yes, right. <laughs> you know, 
move away from the refrigerator. <laughs> you know, so, but when it comes to, to hair, so for me, um, I, I just went from an Afro. Actually, I had years and years and years of a perm. Okay. And then I cut it off and started out with an Afro. And now all I have to do is blow dry it and put a few curls in it and I have this. But the difference between even the new growth and the pressed, or not pressed, but blow dried hair, that tension in between, it seems like it's always breaking off. And I'm like, when I blow dry it, it's all nice and soft. And then in a couple of days, it's like, oh my goodness, what happened? Yes, so it could be a couple of factors. I mean, since we're live, if you don't mind me giving you- I don't mind, I put it out there. Okay, um, I'm looking at your hair. Is it color treated as well? Or is it your natural yeah. brown color? Color treated. Okay, so you have some color. And then how often are you um, applying the heat like to, to freshen up your hairstyle? I just want to, uh, well, Depends on if I have a show, <laughs> but if I don't have a show, I don't do it. You just keep you know, it. Just, mm -hmm. Okay. And then when you do though, apply your heat, um, are you using some type of heat protectant or anything like that? I, the, everything I use, I use every, all the products I use in the same family. Okay. Um, like a, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put it out there. Carol's daughter. Okay. Okay, so I use, everything is is a lot in that family because okay. I just under I, I just think that the chemistry when people put stuff together and they have a whole line that they do it so that it works together to get the result that that they were hoping you would get. That's exactly right. So you're doing so. <laughs> the same within the same line of products. That is something that I always advise my clients to do. So you're right on target. So within the line. That you're using is there a heat protectant that you use um when you do i don't it? think it said that okay i don't think it said uh, on the one that i have okay I don't think it said that. okay so the breakage again it could be a couple of things um one you already identified the two different textures so you have your new growth which is virgin hair hair that hasn't been color treated hair that hasn't experienced a lot of the heat um, styling and some of the tension that can come from that. And then you have the hair that's been color treated and then gets a, ha, or has experienced more of the heat styling than your new growth. And so definitely what happens is it does create almost like a line of demarcation, a separation where as you identify that the point where your new growth meets the hair that's already been out here living, ultimately it's very fragile. It's very fragile. And when you have color treated hair, the hair becomes even more fragile because even though you're not using a chemical straightener, it's still a chemical that's applied that alters the chemistry of your strands. And when you go lighter, so when you're lifting color out of your strands, then that makes the hair even more fragile. And so some of the breakage you may be experiencing could be reduced and or eliminated just by simply incorporating some products into still within Carol's daughter, but I'm sure Carol's daughter has like some form of heat protectant. So something that you can apply to your hair. So on the days when you are planning on blowing it out and adding a few curls, you're adding an extra layer of protection to your hair to prevent any damage from the heat styling. Because again, it's already fragile from the color. And then it's already gonna be fragile um, because you have this new growth and then you have hair that's been straightened. And then another thing um, is just making sure you're deep conditioning regularly. Do you currently, every time you shampoo, deep condition your hair? Okay, so keeping that up is going to be really important. So I would say right now, as far as externally what you're doing, I would just um, advise that you incorporate a heat protectant into your styling regimen when you do heat style it. And then just really try to continue to do what you're doing. Limit how much heat you're applying. So... If you're doing it once a week, that heat protectant is going to be really important. Um, if you're doing it like twice a month, the less heat that you're applying to the hair, um, then the less breakage you should experience. Okay. So when we start looking at our natural hairstyles, I'm such a conservative person. And for me, I love it on other people, but I haven't been bold enough 
to try it for myself because and I change my mind too often. Mm -hmm. So, um, but are there some recommendations on um, maybe certain types of stylists um, or different types of natural hair from the braids to, and are braids good? The ones with the added extension for the braids to the twist. I mean, there's so many names out there. Well, first, Pastor Ronnie, you said that outside of blowing your hair out, you wear it curly. So yeah. Natural. Okay. So when we talk about natural hairstyles and natural hairstyling, it doesn't always mean or reflect that it's intertwined into a braid, a twist, or a lock. It's simply you embracing your hair the way that it naturally grows without permanently altering the curl. So even now, when I look at your hair, it's your natural hair. It's not chemically straightened. I mean, yeah, you added some color, but your hair is natural. And when you wet it, you're going to see even more of the natural curl in it. Um, right. So um, I just want to encourage you, let you know, like, even though you're conservative, you found a natural style that fits you. Um, when it comes to other styles, um, you know, it just might take a little bit of just stepping out of your comfort zone if there's something that, you know, you find yourself really attracted to, if it is a braid or a twist style. And um, I always like to say you can start without extension, especially for a woman like yourself, mm. with styling your natural hair. If you do see some things, start with styles that match the silhouette you're comfortable with. So you you wear a beautiful, you know, short, curly look. So that might mean you might want to try maybe like a little rod set um, where you can get more defined curls or like, you know, twists or something like that. But when we talk about braid styles and like, are they really good for us? And like other extension styles, really what it comes down to, as you mentioned, is the actual stylist. And so as a woman who is interested in exploring some of these styles, but wanting to make sure that they keep your hair healthy, that they're not causing hair loss, it's going to be about finding a stylist who's trained in proper braiding, twisting, and locking techniques um, in order to keep your hair healthy. And this is something that I've built my entire business around. And I actually have an educational platform that I teach and train other stylists in the techniques that I've perfected that have allowed me to grow my business, grow my brand, and also grow my client's hair, which allows them to experience these beautiful braid styles, twist styles, lock styles, without compromising the health of their hair. So are braids healthy for you? Braids can be an excellent option of giving your hair a break from um, constant styling manipulation, which could contribute to breakage, um, give you an opportunity to experience just another style, to see how you feel, see how it makes you feel, um, um, and just the ease, just the freedom of just wearing a style, again, without having to manipulate it on a regular basis. The important thing is how is that style put in um, and who is putting it in. So anyone who's looking for a stylist, definitely check out our platform, Marketing Hair Revolution, where we have a growing number of stylists who are investing in themselves, investing in their skill set, um, so that they can continue to build businesses that serve um, people all over the world and help them keep their hair healthy. Now, are these these individuals, do they go through a long training with you or and are they do they go through refresher stuff? How does that work? Because it seems like a hairstylist is always in the shop. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are always in the shop. We're always serving. Um, yeah, my programs are about three to four months and I maintain ongoing relationships with my stylist. So they go through formal training. Some people, the minimum, they're able to finish in the four months. Some people, it takes them a little longer to go through all the coursework. But I'm committed to the excellence of my stylist. And so before throwing them out there, you know, and they're very, they, they have integrity as well. And so we make sure that they're comfortable, they're confident in certain techniques, that they're constantly practicing and mastering certain skills before we are promoting them to the public. And as far as being in the salon all day, that's part of the training um, and helping stylists create the balance, a work-life balance. Um, 
where they can serve and, and operate and move in their gift, um, but then find time for that self-care, which becomes important. Because sometimes what happens um, with stylists is because they are working so hard to serve others and they're not serving themselves, the burnout happens. And then unfortunately, this can lead to some of the stereotypes that we experience, especially within the black hair industry of some of our stylists not being professional. Um, and that can lead into not being on time or taking too long or not following up or not being consistent with their prices or whatever it may be. And I find that oftentimes some of that is due to lack of education and exposure on how to set that up because natural hair and braiding is such a cultural practice for us. And then some of that is the result over time where a stylist, when they first get into it, they're like calling people back and they're doing their thing. But when the overwhelm happens mm. and they don't have systems in place to manage it, then the client starts to experience some of the neglect. And then we have again these stereotypes. So I'm very much committed to eradicating some of these practices by providing this training um, in the format in which I provide it for stylists so that they can serve in excellence and then they have a business that they're building that's sustainable and can continue to maintain a reputation for them so they can continue to build wealth and we can continue to take care of one another. Now you mentioned training individuals. So does that mean you're not seeing clients anymore? Yes, I am at the point in my career where I am unable to take new uh, personal clients in the salon, which is actually a blessing. Um, I've served in the industry one on one with clients for over 14 years and I'm at a space now where I need to pour into other stylists who are in this space. And so uh, my gift at this point in my career is best served in the educational space um, because working one on one, I can only reach so many people. But the need, which is, you know, the conversation we're having, the need for so many people um, around the world for um, finding a stylist who's committed to their hair care journey, um, committed to finding solutions for them and providing styles that really help to support their hair growth journey. I'm now committed, committing myself to the professionals. Um, so for all those who want Dr. Kelly to be here, I feel blessed. And I feel confident enough to say that through my training programs, you will be able to experience the legacy that I've built through my own practice through the stylist that I train. So, so speak to, keep hitting me up though. Okay. I can so, so, so does that mean that a person couldn't even come to you to get their scalp evaluated? Yes, so I uh, no longer have my salon space. I have okay. transitioned. Uh, into film and television as far as what I do on a regular basis. So like I like to say my regular job now <laughs> is no longer I'm managing the salon, but I'm working in the film and television space. Um, so unfortunately, again, along with hair care styling services, I no longer offer the one-on-one -on -one trichology consultations, um, but I also have a trichology certification program. So I have trichologists who I've trained and who've actually trained with me for years. So I have about three trichologists for sure who've been with me for about five years, training with me. I've mentored them. They're very uh, confident and they are making steps in their own right as trichologists in this industry who when I um, encounter individuals or people inquire about consulting services with me, I'm able to put them in touch with one of the trichologists certified psychologist on my team. And I also work very closely with the dermatologist. So if through an initial inquiry, I determine that actually they need more medical help. And I know that the step of the psychologist will just be an extra step that's going to lead them to the dermatologist. I just refer them straight to the dermatologist. Okay. So let's talk to the one who is interested in going into cosmetology. Okay. So what would you say to them? This is someone that has potentially been doing hair in the kitchen <laughs> for a few years and say, you know what, I really think I'm ready to make this a business. What would you say to them? I would encourage the person who wants to step into cosmetology to take the step 
to invest in yourself and take the step to get the licensing that you need so that you can fully build a sustainable business. Um, in my own experience, what I found, especially when you're starting off with your gift, your talent, and you're working out of your home, that next step can feel intimidating. I make it feel a little scary. There can be a little bit of insecurity around it, whether it's about just the actual action of going to school or even sometimes the financial investment that's required in order to secure that license. Um, one thing that I like to teach and encourage is that an investment in yourself is invaluable. You're gonna always get the best return. And so to not allow um, any type of fear that might try to grip you from moving even more into your career, because again, similar to where I am, you know, you get to a point when you're serving where you realize I have outgrown this space, this season. So if you are the stylist who's been working out of your home and you get this unction in your spirit, I feel like I want to go to cosmetology school, but I'm not sure. There's something in you that's letting you know you're outgrowing your space. And I would just encourage you to lean into that because when you lean into it, the next level is there. And to believe in yourself that the same thing that you were able to do in your living room when you were just like, I'm having fun. And now you're feeling like, I need to take this to the next level, that you have exactly what it takes to go to school and get what you need so that you can continue to move forward to serve more people. Because again, my journey, I started in my living room and it got to the point where I realized I'm stifling my growth when I stay in my house because the reality is I'm not serving everybody. I'm not letting everybody come to my house. Anybody who I meet on the street, I'm not just passing out cards to everybody. I had like strict policies like, when people would refer people to me, they knew I'm like, they're coming to my house. Like, I didn't want new referrals for men unless it was like your, your cousin, your cousin. Like, you had to know this man before he came to my house for any service. <laughs> so, there's like certain limitations. When I realized that I was limiting my ability to serve, I had to take the step. So, I would encourage anyone who's considering take the step. You're going to be okay, it's going to open the door to your next level. And it will allow you to continue to sharpen your skill and share your gift with so many more people. And the key thing, too, especially if money is the, is the problem or the factor or the thing that keeps you stuck, to remember that you can replenish money, but you can't replenish time. Amen. Amen. So what about to the mobile hairstylist? Mobile hairstylist. Um, well, actually, you know, after this year of COVID, uh, mobility is even more common. I know that within the black hairstyling industry, you know, us black hairstylists, we was already used to it. Again, we talking about working out our rooms and kitchens. So when they shut it down, I feel like every black hairstylist is like, you know what to do, girl. You know where I'm at, you know. <laughs> or I'm going to come to you, again, if you don't want everyone coming into your space, which we have, you know, those conversations had to happen because of COVID as far as being careful and the health and safety of others. Um, but I think that coming out of that mobility, mobile services are becoming more and more popular and more of a preference. Um, and so I think for the mobile hairstylist, it's really, really important one, to have um, structured systems in place on how you serve clients in their home because you want to maintain the professionalism and making sure that even though you're in a home environment, that you have a system in which you're communicating to your client if you're traveling to them, the setup, the space, what you need to provide that service. So being mindful of that. And then even if it's within your own home, making sure you're setting it up so that it's still a professional environment. And then thinking about the health and safety. So again, the systems, what are the protocols, making sure you're disinfecting your tools, making sure you have, you know, the proper systems in place within your client's home. Because again, when you're in mobile environments, you only have so much control over the environment. So communication is going to be so important. Those disinfection protocols, those health and safety protocols are going to be so important. Um, and those systems are going to be so important. I know that the state board, um, I just finished my eight year tenure of serving on the state board of barbering and cosmetology. And I do know that there are um, some new regulations that are going to be implemented for professionals to provide service um, 
mobily, but to be able to do it in a way where the state can keep track because the whole purpose of the board is the health and safety of the public. So mobile hairstylists, uh, make sure that you're staying tapped in to the state board. And even outside of that, make sure that you're just thinking about the things that I listed for your health and safety, for your client's health and safety, and just to make sure you're, again, that you're building a business that you that is sustainable. Amen. So um, the other question I have, okay, say, we, let's go back to the hair for a minute. Um, we have, a, I'm looking at your hair and I'm like, that looks so good on you. Thank you. But once we figured out our style, um, and let's let's use your style for example. What do we need to do to our hair? Just, just I mean, because we grew up greasing our scalp every Saturday night, so we'd be cute for Sunday morning, right? So, what what do we need to do to take care of the hair um, after after we figured out our style? Is moisture on the outside a benefit, or should we just leave it alone till we wash it again? Oh my goodness, moisture is so important, especially for black hair. So the products have changed, but this goes back to the simplicity of the care, um, keeping your hair clean, keeping it conditioned and keeping it lubricated. So you're shampooing, you're conditioning, you oiling. And it may not be blue magic and it may not be pink lotion, but <laughs> there are a number of, again, new brands, Carol's Daughter, um, Eden Body Works, Shea Moisture. There's all these wonderful brands that have, you know, shampoos, conditioners, and some type of lubricant in the form of a serum or a hair oil. Mm -hmm. And so once you've selected your style, just those basic steps will keep your hair healthy. And then the final step that should always happen is what you said, Pastor Rhonda, moisture. Moisture. Because we think about the science of black hair, um, to keep it simple, it's naturally dry. It's naturally dry. So we have to supplement. And we supplement with the use of products that will continuously give our hair moisture. And so I have a line of products that I formulated. And one of the main products that I formulated is my Dr. K daily spray for the exact reason why you're asking. It's that one of the issues that my clients constantly tell me is, but what do I put on my hair every day because it feels dry or how do I prevent it from getting dry or breaking? And so, yes, there's plenty of shampoos and conditioners I love. There are a lot of oil combinations that I like, but I personally could not find a, a moisturizer that my clients of all hair types could use. So for anyone watching, for you, Pastor Rhonda, if you're looking for a lightweight product, that can help you retain the moisture in your hair that will blend well with other products because we talked about you know staying within a line of products and i'm very conscious of that as well the dr day dr k daily spray is an excellent lightweight product that you can literally mist on your hair every single day whether you're wearing your short fro your big fro your braids your twists locks like myself whether you're adding extensions or not it is an excellent addition to your daily hair care regimen and it will not create or cause any type of um, buildup or residue in the hair. And is there a website to find that on? Yes, you can purchase the products at beautybydrcary.com. Um, that's beautybydrcary, K-A-R-I.com. I also have a comb out cream. So when we talk about um, protective styles and things like that and breakage, a lot of breakage happens during that comb out process, whether you're just detangling your hair because it's time for you to comb your hair or you're removing a style. A lot of breakage comes through or during that removal or comb out process. So my comb out cream helps to make that process a lot easier. It makes the tangling easier. It reduces breakage. It's a great uh, pre-shampoo treatment as well as I've had gotten feedback from a lot of customers and clients that it can be even used as a leave-in. It's safe. Pre-shampoo, tell me Pre about that. Pre-shampoo, so if you have, again, you're experiencing a lot of dry hair, um, you feel like your hair is really dry or it's tangled or matted, prior to shampooing your hair, you saturate your hair with the comb out cream. And what it does is it begins to hydrate and lubricate the strands. 
So it begins that process of softening, hydrating, lubricating the strands. It starts to gently remove dirt or buildup that is uh, stuck to the hair strands or might be causing you know, a little bit of tangling and matting in the hair. And one thing that is so important, especially for black people, especially for anyone with curly hair, is before you shampoo, you always wanna make sure you completely detangle and comb out your hair. Because as soon as those curls or those coils hit that water, they're going to retract. And if you have buildup or any existing knots that you did not comb through prior to shampooing the hair, your curls are going to retract around those areas and it can cause more knotting and more tangling after you shampoo. So then you find yourself shampooing and then now your hair is tangling. And you're like taking your time and you're putting conditioner and you're trying to comb it out. Use the Dr. K comb out cream first. <laughs> first step. And you can avoid all of that potential drama that can happen <laughs> after you shampoo your hair. Someone told me, okay, what is what is the deal with the squeaky clean? One of the things they said was that we need to clean our scalp better than we have been. And where a lot of shampoos don't really do that, they clean the hair, but not the scalp. Is that something we should be concerned with? Yes, um, definitely cleansing the scalp is really important. And a lot of us neglect cleaning the scalp, especially if you have a lot of hair and it's really thick. We see the shampoo commercials and they're just lathering and they don't oftentimes look like us, but they just lather in their hair, you know, and no one's cleansing the scalp. And this is really important because what I find is that a lot of people, men and women and children, start to complain of itchy scalps, flaky scalps, things that they're like, I never experienced this before. But what happens is if the scalp is not cleansed thoroughly, there's an accumulation of dirt and natural oils that the scalp produces, oils that you're adding that will build up on the scalp and, just, and start to cause these disorders. So making sure you're cleansing the scalp is important. And then using a clarifying shampoo, as you stated, Pastor Rhonda, there are a lot of products. Um, we focus on using moisturizing shampoos. And there are some cleansers in the moisturizing shampoos that will gently, gently lift and remove dirt. Um, but when we're talking about really cleansing and removing dirt from the scalp, you want something that's clarifying. How you identify a clarifying shampoo is that it's typically more clear. So you have like your opaque kind of creamy shampoos. Those are more moisturizing. But if you have like a clear shampoo, sometimes they're labeled as clarifying shampoos or deep cleansers. They typically have ingredients like tea tree oil and peppermint, which are essential oils that naturally help to eliminate, they're like antibacterial agents and eliminate itching and inflammatory things on the scalp. And so you want to focus on finding these types of products. And when you do, don't do this. You want to part through your hair and actually apply the shampoos directly to your scalp. No. Wow. And focus on building the lather from there so that you're cleansing the scalp. And then when you get to your moisturizing shampoo, if you want to do a little bit of herbal essence, you know, <laughs> you want to do that, then that's great. But you want to make sure that you're definitely getting uh, dirt and buildup from the scalp. Now, I was watching YouTube the other day and they were cleaning the hair more with like a milking the cow kind of uh, technique. Is that something versus the herbal essence? Because I know exactly. Yes, yes. I remember that commercial. <laughs> and I'm being funny, but I'm so glad you brought that up because I actually do not recommend you piling the hair on top of the head, especially as curly coil girls. Definitely washing the hair in a downward motion prevents tangling and matting um, of the hair while shampooing. So that is actually not the right movement <laughs> for curly hair. Um, you do want to make sure that you're shampooing, rinsing the hair in one direction. Awesome. And then the uh, probably one of the last things we get to talk about is the chemicals in the product. Okay. I heard you mention essential oils. You know, when we're looking for, you know, hair care products for curly hair, um, what are there any uh, things that are in there that we should, that are really like, oh, no, don't get that one. Don't put that product in your hair. 
Um, well, you definitely want to avoid products that will overly dry out the hair. And I, I have this conversation a lot, especially when it comes to like the different alcohols. So you'll look at a label on your products and there's different types of alcohols. You'll see like a sterile alcohol, a sotero alcohol. Um, but then you, if you see like an isopropyl alcohol, then you want to stay away from that. So the way that I like to simplify it for consumers, so you're not trying to like remember all these scientific names, is when you see the word alcohol on a label, don't immediately freak out because there are a lot of these fatty alcohols like your sotero and your sterile alcohols, which are emulsifiers. And they're needed to help blend like the water and the oils in the product. So you want to say yes to C and S, meaning if you see any type of alcohols that start with a C or a S, then yes, you good. But you want to say nope to the prop. So if you see any alcohols that have that P-R-O-P, whether it's a prefix or a suffix or it's in there, like isopropyl, it's in the middle, then you not. Nah, you got to just no. I shouldn't, you know, get that product. So that's definitely an ingredient that I would say we need to ab avoid a paraben. Um, I know a lot of consumers, well, some may be familiar, some may not. But in recent research, it's been found that parabens have been linked to certain cancers, especially cervical cancer in women. So you want to avoid products. And a lot of products now, because this research has come out, they'll say right on the label, no parabens. Um, so you just want to check. Um, to make sure that you are avoiding products with parabens in them. Um, now, a controversial, well, I'm calling it controversial because of my own um, scientific understanding of this ingredient is sulfates. So I know over like the last 10 years, we've been in this movement of sulfate-free, 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 and we've gotten away from the use of sulfates. The reality is a lot of product chemists still actually put sulfate in your product. They just go under a different name and they may just be milder. And a sulfate is ultimately a surfactant that cuts through dirt and grease. Um, and it is very strong. And when you look up what a sulfate does, because you don't just see sulfates in hair care products, it's in your toothpaste, it's in other products as well, is um, it is, it can be an irritant especially when used on a regular or consistent basis. Um, I say controversial because again, it's my belief specifically when it comes to black hair that the use of a sulfate is not detrimental to the health of the hair. So I say this to say, if we're talking about ingredients, if you are someone who doesn't shampoo your hair frequently, I know there's a lot of us, who you might shampoo your hair once a month. Sometimes I hear once every six to eight weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah. You need a sulfate. You need a shampoo that has this ingredient that can deep clean and cut through the buildup, the dirt again, especially with curly coiled hair. You're putting on oils and products and then your body's naturally secreting them. You need something that will remove that dirt and build up from the hair and scalp. If you are someone who shampoos your hair more frequently, maybe one to two times a week, then you do want to limit your use of sulfates because that regular use of the sulfate can cause drying of the scalp and or of the hair. But the key thing is making sure you're following up with a moisturizing shampoo and that's your deep conditioning. Wow. That's really, really good. Really helpful. And I, as Jill says, thanks for this, all this helpful information. Oh, so welcome, Jill. <laughs> oh, this has been a great conversation. I could see a time where we would need to have you back oh. uh, so that we can talk about it and maybe even have a couple of cancer survivors on where they can talk about the different things that they have gone through in, in losing the hair. And yes, they say it all grows back. Um, and however, when it grows back, it's a different grade. So sometimes we have to adjust to a different grade. But the reality is, as far as what I have seen, <laughs> it actually kind of comes back to what it was originally. Yeah. Um, because otherwise you'd be able to walk down the street and be able to tell by their hair who had cancer. 
Mm. And I love to tell the reason as to why cancer survivors have to lose their hair in the first place. And I know it's through, uh, you know, the, the chemotherapy, but I believe there's a, a, a spiritual reason why they lose their hair. Okay. Because God lost count and he had to start over. <laughs> the Bible tells us that, the, that God knows all of the hairs, the number of hairs on your head. And so just to keep us laughing in the midst of it all. I brought that. I decided that that was a good one. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, so thank you so much for joining with us today and uh, sharing this marvelous knowledge um, so that we can be better and know better. And also tell us again, how do we get a hold of your product? Yes, you can find my products at Beauty by Dr. Carrie, K A R I. Dot com. You can also visit my website, drcarriewilliams.com, and you can also link to my shop there. And if you're on social media, you can find me on Instagram at drcarriewill, W-I-L-L, as well as on Facebook, Dr. Carrie Williams. So is this the, is, did I do it right? Beauty yes, by, by drcarrie.com. Right. Yay. So, <laughs> so again, thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, and um, Dr. Carrie Williams has presented us information today about uh, hair care um, for both men and women. And we also wanted to, again, let's see, I got so much going on over here. Um, <laughs> remind you that uh, we can definitely um, support Celebrate Life Cancer Ministry if you are a cancer survivor and uh, looking for support or a caregiver that's helping someone throughout the journey, feel free to, um, to reach out to us on our website at celebratelifecm.org and give us a call at 323-577-5443. It has truly been a privilege to be with you today and we look forward to seeing you next time. And as we always say, until next time, choose life.